world news tonight. Climate chaos. India chokes as toxic smog gets the better of mankind. Quadruple catastrophe. Record setting rains flood the Pacific Northwest in Mother Nature's latest blow. Another step. Pfizer introduces a game changing pill to protect low income countries. Comforting hands. A pharmacist goes an extra mile to get kids comfortable with COVID vaccines. From the global resources of the Verna Media Network, this is Other Verna World News Tonight. Now reporting from Studio 24 in Colombo, here's Suzanne Shainali. Very good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. On today's coverage, we start off with the growing climate crisis. The leading cause of respiratory ailments in Indians may soon change from COVID to climate issues as toxic smog blankets areas of the country, causing patients to choke. Hospitals in New Delhi reported a spike in the number of patients with respiratory ailments and doctors on Tuesday blamed a surge of air pollution blanketing India's capital. The city, home to 20 million, is often ranked the world's most polluted capital due to coal-fired energy plants and burning garbage out in the open. The burning of rice paddy straw also contributes to pollution in winter. New Delhi has battled a toxic haze since earlier this month, but this week took emergency measures, shutting down schools and construction work for four days. As air quality plummeted, the Supreme Court ordered measures to halt non-essential vehicle traffic, cut industrial pollution and limit dust. The court also told authorities to shut offices in New Delhi and nearby cities and allow millions of people to work from home. But not everyone can. Food vendors are forced to breathe the harsh air and endure burning eyes to make a living. We have to come with our stalls in any weather because it's our livelihood. The pollution is unbearable. The government must take some steps. We are forced to work because we can't stay indoors forever. The air quality index in New Delhi on Monday reached 403 out of 500, indicating, quote, severe conditions that can cause respiratory illness on prolonged exposure. A quadruple catastrophe is hitting Washington state this week as record rains, fierce flooding, strong winds and multiple landslides strike across the state. More than 500 people have been forced from their homes near the border to Canada due to the devastating weather. This deadly and devastating deluge delivering an unrelenting blow to the Pacific Northwest, a quadruple catastrophe. Record rain, fierce flooding, whipping winds, and multiple mudslides. They're in a bad way out there. There's a lot of water, and it's only getting higher. With northern Washington state in the storm's bullseye, more than 500 people have been forced from their homes as daring rescues unfold near the Canadian border. Child's with them holding, it's a very small child. The Coast Guard plucking a baby, three children, and six adults from fast rising waters. In just hours, six inches of rain swamped the region, a state of emergency amid these deadly conditions. Facing peril on both sides of the border, massive helicopters lifted over 300 to safety. Many trapped overnight after a highway buckled and a landslide killed at least one in Canada. Back-to-back -back atmospheric rivers helping to dump 40 inches of rain in just 31 days. The wettest fall on record for Seattle. With climate change fueling the intensity and frequency of storms like these, powerful gusts nearly toppled a big rig over the side of a towering bridge as landslides reshaped the geography here. The brunt of the storm has passed, but not the flooding. Tonight, one disaster now followed by another for a region still deep in misery. U.S. President Joe Biden in his latest public address stated that America will soon begin moving again as he attempted to boost the slumping numbers of Democrat popularity. Because of this delegation, New Hampshire and America are moving again. Fresh from signing the bipartisan infrastructure bill into law, U.S. President Joe Biden on Tuesday traveled to New Hampshire, a key state in next year's midterm elections, where he spoke from the NH 175 bridge one of many in need of repair. This may not seem like a big bridge, but it saves lives and solves problems. And right now there are 215 bridges in your state, 
215 bridges deemed structurally unsafe in New Hampshire alone. Biden and fellow Democrats are betting that bipartisan progress on popular policies like infrastructure spending and job creation can win over voters in the face of slumping polls. You know, let me tell you, the infrastructure law signed yesterday, and this is not hyperbole, would not have been possible without this delegation. That's a fact. To that end, Biden gave a boost to the New Hampshire Democrats who helped make the bill happen. In particular, Senator Maggie Hassan, who is up for re-election in 2022 and could face a close race, some analysts say. Maggie, you did one hell of a job. Because, folks, you should know that Maggie was a key player in every aspect of this law. New Hampshire is also home to two congressional contests for positions now held by Democrats in a midterm where the party can afford barely any losses. Biden's approval rating in New Hampshire, which he carried by 7.4 percentage points in 2020, is around 44 percent, according to the latest statewide poll conducted in October by St. Anselm College. Biden travels to Detroit on Wednesday, and Vice President Kamala Harris visits Columbus, Ohio on Friday to tout the package in an effort to hammer home the message that Democrats delivered on their promises. Russia's defense ministry admitted to destroying one of its satellites during a missile test but rejected U.S. accusations that it had endangered the International Space Station. U.S. officials accused Russia of a dangerous and irresponsible strike on a satellite that had created a cloud of debris and forced the ISS crew to take evasion action. It is a missile test that sent the crew of the International Space Station racing for safe haven in their spaceship capsules, just in case a quick getaway was necessary. For earlier on Monday, according to the U.S., Russia fired a projectile into space and blew up one of its old defunct satellites, sending a debris cloud into orbit, one that is made up of 1,500 trackable fragments and hundreds of thousands of others and they could potentially collide with other satellites or the ISS. Even if the seven-member crew, including two Russians, were able to leave the Soyuz and Dragon capsules and after a couple NASA hours, the United Schmidt. States said the risk to the research lab and other satellites could last years. Russia's dangerous and irresponsible behavior jeopardizes the long-term sustainability of our outer space and clearly demonstrates that Russia's claims of opposing the weaponization of space are disingenuous and hypocritical. The test has raised a red flag for the U.S. about a new form of Star Wars, with a race by countries like Russia to flex their space muscles with new weapons. Russia did not comment on the test, but said on Twitter that its cosmonauts on the ISS were safe. Also, Russia isn't alone in showing its ability to shoot down satellites. The U.S., India and China have also done it as well. Currently, there are over 4,500 satellites orbiting the Earth that are used for crucial weather intelligence, finance and communications information. So the increasing quantity of space junk and the deliberate creation of it has sparked more calls for international rules on such tests. Polish forces fired tear gas and deployed water cannons against stone-throwing migrants trying to cross the Belarusian border, sparking accusations from Belarus that Poland was trying to escalate the crisis. Tensions boil over at this border crossing. Polish police fire water cannon at a group of migrants. They say threw objects from the Belarusian side, severely injuring an officer. It's one example of the mounting pressure after weeks of thousands of asylum seekers being stranded in limbo. Belarusian President Alexander Lukashenko said Tuesday he spoke to German Chancellor Angela Merkel about reducing the strain. We came to an agreement that escalation is not in the interests of either the European Union or Belarus. We cannot allow an escalation to happen, even though some may wish for it to happen, all the way up to a direct military confrontation. Most of the migrants arrived in Belarus from the Middle East, many taking planes to Minsk after being granted visas. Migrants report then being taken to the borders and told they can't go back to the Belarusian capital. Belarus army forced me and all my friend to get here yeah. and the soldier uh, take our uh, mobile phone the eu says belarus is weaponizing migrants in revenge for sanctions 
President Lukashenko denies this, but a former Belarusian diplomat told France 24 this is exactly what Lukashenko planned. Lukashenko promised that, okay, if you impose sanctions on me, then I will be organizing the problems on your border uh, to put a blind eye on this uh, illegal migration. So he just fulfilled the promise. Scenes of chaos like these do not reflect well on the EU. But as winter approaches, the Polish government says it is preparing for the crisis to stretch on for months. The latest on the COVID crisis right after this break, you're watching World News. Welcome back and we move on to the updates of the COVID crisis. Two-week COVID-19 case counts are up in every state across New England except Connecticut. This comes as Americans are preparing to travel for the holidays. Tonight, the federal government playing catch-up with states on who's eligible for a booster shot. In an about-face, the FDA could act as early as Thursday to authorize Pfizer's booster for anyone over 18. This news comes amid a stark warning tonight from Vermont, where a nation leading 72 percent of residents are fully vaccinated. The pandemic is not over. Here, COVID is making a comeback, driving the surge, the unvaccinated. The data speaks for itself. About three quarters of Vermont's hospitalizations and about 70 percent of our cases are unvaccinated. Vermont's two-week case count jumps 60 percent. In fact, across New England, the two-week case count is up in every state except Connecticut. Yet even there, the virus is taking a deadly toll. At the Gear Village Senior Community, a nursing home and rehabilitation center, eight residents died, 89 residents and staff infected since the end of September. This despite nearly all having been vaccinated. The same folks that we found were vulnerable at the beginning are still vulnerable. All these warning signs as Americans get ready to travel for the holidays amid COVID fatigue and mixed messaging on who should get booster shots. Still, health officials say vaccinations remain the best defense. Despite an uptick in cases in some areas, Washington, D.C.'s mayor announcing the city will lift its indoor mask mandate for public places Monday. We have some good news for you. Pfizer has signed a deal to allow licensing for generic versions of Paxlovid, the COVID-19 oral treatment in 95 low to middle income countries. The drug has shown promising results in clinical trials and is seen as a potential game changer with hopes pinned on saving lives in lower income countries. Pfizer announced on Tuesday that it has completed submission for emergency use authorization of its experimental antiviral COVID-19 pill with the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. In a clinical trial, Pfizer's drug Paxlovid cut the chance of hospitalization or death for adults at risk of severe disease by 89 percent. The pill could be a promising new weapon in the fight against the pandemic, as it can be taken as an early at-home treatment in a five-day regimen to help prevent COVID-19 hospitalizations and deaths. It could also become an important tool in countries and areas with limited access to vaccines or low vaccination rates. A panel of outside advisors to the FDA will meet at the end of the month to consider a competing antiviral pill from Merck and Ridgeback Biotherapeutics, who have already applied for emergency use authorization. Pfizer said it has begun the process of seeking authorization in several countries, including the United Kingdom, Australia, New Zealand, and South Korea and plans further international submissions. Meanwhile, the Washington Post reported Tuesday that U.S. President Joe Biden's administration is expected to announce this week the purchase of 10 million courses of Pfizer's pill. It is not immediately clear when U.S. regulators will rule on Pfizer's application. Thousands of children in the Philippines returned to schools for the first time in nearly two years. Kicking off a pilot scheme to resume face-to-face -face learning after the pandemic disrupted the education of 27 million students. Around 100 schools throughout the Philippines reopened. It was a tentative return with students allowed inside the school grounds for a maximum of four and a half hours. Parents at this school in Cebu welcomed the decision. At first, I did not agree. 
But when I saw the Department of Education protocol complied with social distancing rules, then I did agree. We have not been able to prioritize our daughter's education because we have animals to take care of. We could only teach her in the afternoon or in the evening. Class sizes are smaller, desks are made safer with plastic sheeting, and masks are compulsory. The pilot project is for two months. Students attend in-person classes one week and stay at home for remote learning the next. If they are attending classes, they are socializing and interacting in the classroom where they can um, improve their speaking skills, their reading abilities. The Philippines is one of the last countries to resume in-person teaching. The return is a test only, with just one in three people fully vaccinated in the country. The internet giant Google said it will spend $1 billion in Australia over five years, resetting ties months after a threat to pull its service to avoid tougher government regulation. For more on this, we have other than a world news pressure correspondent Timothy Phillip reporting from Melbourne in Australia. Timothy? Yes, Shana. The main operating unit of Alphabet Inc. said it planned to expand cloud infrastructure, set up a research hub staffed by Australian researchers and engineers, and partner with the Commonwealth Scientific and Industrial Research Organization. Google Australia Managing Director Mel Silva, who earlier this year threatened to block Google's search engine in the country, said the spending plan would bring significant technology resources and investment. Prime Minister Scott Morrison called the plan a billion-dollar vote of confidence in Australia and said it would bring more STEM jobs to their show. Australia has also said it plans to make large internet companies take legal responsibility for defamation and misinformation posted on their platforms, a change which the technology sector has largely opposed. The Australian Institute Centre for Responsible Technology, a think tank, said the spending commitment made a great headline but simply paying tax on Australian earnings would deliver far more money to Australia. Back to you, Shana. All right, thank you. That was other than a World News Special Correspondent Timothy Phillip reporting from Melbourne in Australia. Let's go into a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more World News. Welcome back and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Armenia reported at least one fatality and a loss of military positions in border clashes with Azerbaijan troops a year after the ARC force fought a war over the disputed Nagorno-Karabakh region. Chile's Senate declined to impeach President Sebastián Pinere over a business deal revealed in the Pandora Papers leaks, refusing to go along with the lower chamber of Congress in opening proceedings against him. French police cleared a major migrant camp that was home to around a thousand people hoping to reach Britain amid tensions between London and Paris over channel crossings. South Korea is shortening the interval between primary and booster vaccine doses. Prime Minister Kim Bo Kyam says people aged 60 and above can get booster shots at least four months after being fully inoculated. An 86-year-old great-grandmother was crowned Miss Holocaust survivor in an annual Israeli beauty pageant designed to honor women who endured the horrors of the Nazi genocide. A man said to be of great interest in the investigation into the murder of Haitian President Jovenel Moise has been arrested in Turkey. Turkish authorities have arrested a man in connection with the July assassination of Haitian President Jovenel Moise, Haiti's Foreign Minister Claude Joseph said late on Monday. The 53-year-old former businessman Moise, who took office in 2017, was shot dead at his private residence and his wife was wounded in the attack. A group of Colombian mercenaries emerged as the main suspects, though nobody's been charged or convicted in connection with the case. Joseph said on Twitter that he'd thanked Turkey for the arrest of Samir Handel, whom he called, quote, one of the persons of great interest in the investigation. Turkish media reported on Tuesday that Handel, who was being sought with an Interpol red notice, was detained at Istanbul airport by authorities. The arrest came as he was flying transit from the United States to Jordan. Turkey's interior ministry did not immediately respond to a request for comment on the matter. 
And finally tonight, Pennsylvania pharmacist Chichi Moma is going above and beyond to make kids comfortable with getting their vaccine shot, trading in her white coat for a cartoon costume and even holding a carnival. A Pennsylvania school gym turned into a carnival may be the best place for kids to get vaccinated with balloons, candy and superheroes. You did it! You got this? Taking the sting out of the shot, the woman in the costume, pharmacist Chichi Moma, came up with the idea, getting more than 18,000 kids vaccinated. And she had experience to make it work. I give good shots. When Chichi's small pharmacy was inundated with calls from adults wanting the vaccine in a county with no public health department, she got busy and went from having only 100 doses to giving out more than 30,000 vaccines. And she did the same thing to get shots for kids, but traded in her white pharmacy coat for a cartoon costume. And if taking off the white coat makes the child more comfortable, that's exactly what I'm going to do. Parents lined up with their kids. It's, it's remarkable. One woman on a mission. Doing what I love to do, which is helping people. Helping them stay well. In case you have missed any of the stories we aired tonight, you can re-watch by catching us on our YouTube page, youtube.com slash English. And that's all the news we have for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow with another edition of World News. I'm Suzanne Shinali. Until then, stay safe and have a good night.